Welcome to Nebraska. We finally rolled along down the highway far enough to reach the land of crops and corn and farmers and friendly faces. But there's also a lot of history in Nebraska if you know where to look. From the interstate, you mostly see endless farms and people trying to get out of Nebraska as fast as they can. And that was even more true in the 1850s. Because even though we're in Nebraska, we're actually on the Oregon Trail. We are standing at the site of the historical Fort Kearney, an important stop on the Oregon Trail, not far from the Platte River. The actual site where endless thousands of pioneers rolled up their covered wagons into the fort for a little protection from the US Army and to get much needed supplies, maybe wagon repairs. We're talking about people heading to Oregon to start farming there. We're talking about people headed to California in search of gold and the old sod and wood constructed Fort Kearney was a very important stop for them. So important that Fort Kearney is actually featured in the video game, The Oregon Trail. And some travelers would have desperately needed to use the facilities like this, the blacksmith shop, to fix up their wagons and resupply to get them to Oregon or California. Well, at least the ones who didn't die of dysentery. Wow. Look at that, there's some old Mormon pioneer hand carts. Famously, many Mormons traveled to Utah with only the belongings they could fit on a hand human Hold card. No oxen for them. No wonder they wanted to get the heck out of Nebraska. Now, as you can see, there's not much left of the fort at all. I believe the blacksmith shop is actually a recreation even. That's what tends to happen to buildings made of dirt. But it's a fascinating stop on my own way back to California. And a nice place to stretch the old legs on the way to something truly epic in a little bit. Pretty wild to think about this log fort with buildings made of dirt being the closest thing to quote unquote civilization for hundreds or maybe thousands of miles. This place outfitted soldiers for the Indian Wars, pioneers traveling across the landscape, provided a place to rest for all the people riding in, walking alongside of, or pulling carts. It was definitely different for our ancestors traveling back then. No air conditioning, no gas stations, and no tourist attractions. We certainly are lucky. And if you're expecting a little bit of tourist attraction action here at Fort Kearney, other than the small museum in the visitor center here, which has a lot of interesting displays, a lot of historical information, a lot of good stuff about the Oregon Trail, etc., then you're going to be disappointed. But not to worry, my friends, if you were looking for a place that combines both history and you're looking for a roadside attraction that combines history with fun for the whole family, you're in luck. Because once travelers swapped the covered wagon for the automobile and the Oregon Trail for the national highways, Nebraska did not disappoint. And now we're gonna head down old US Highway 6 to what once was Nebraska's most popular tourist attraction, the incredible Harold Warps. Pioneer Village. This is an incredible tourist attraction that at one time had over 150,000 visitors per year. Pulling off the old US Highway 6 here, lured by a lot of hand-painted signs and old school advertising to visit something they had never seen anything like before. Normally when I visit classic roadside attractions or old school historical spots located off of little highways, I need to use old photographs and postcards and old footage to show you what it looked like back in the day. But that is completely unnecessary here at the Pioneer Village. I mean, just look at this building. It is very much the same tourist attraction people were checking out even as far back as the 1950s. And I am super stoked to step inside. This is already unbelievable. I am psyched. Look at these ticket signs. All right, just $15 gets you in. And this is already unlike anything I've ever seen before. I mean, just look at the size of this place. And this is just one wing of the first main building. I don't even know where to start, but we begin our journey with transportation. Very fitting for a road trip. Look at these. These are some of the first ever buggies dating back to the 1840s. There's an old school Conestoga wagon over here behind me, which is amazing for being so close to the Oregon Trail. And even an 1850s stagecoach. You know what, while we look at these, I should tell you a little bit about Harold Warp himself. He was born here in Nebraska in 1903 and later moved to Chicago where he started a very successful plexiglass company. The material was ideal for early greenhouses. It let in all the UV rays and whatnot, but they really hit their stride when they began making plexiglass for airplanes in World War II. The United States built over 88,000 planes during the war, many of them fitted with Harold's plexiglass. This of course made Harold Warp 
fabulously wealthy. And rather than buying mansions or setting himself up as a king somewhere, he figured there was no better way to spend the money than to head back to Nebraska and open his pioneer village to celebrate and preserve the memory of the last couple centuries' amazing explosion of technology and Progress. This is amazing. There are so many classic automobiles in here, particularly Fords. And unlike many other museums, Harold has arranged them in pretty much chronological order. That's something even Greenfield Village didn't do. And that's where Ford was born. You can really see the way they change from year to year. Look at this. Here's the one with the first steel body and door. Notice there's only one door. Not even a door on the driver's side. The second oldest Ford station wagon in the world. And they just keep going and evolving and changing. And you can really see the progress from something like this to something more like this. And there's a lot more than Fords in here. Here's a Sears horseless carriage. I never even knew Sears made cars. Got the REO, an old Rambler, a Studebaker, which just a few years earlier had been a wagon company. Dude, these things are amazing. Makes me want to get some goggles and go for a ride. I guess we better hurry on through the vehicles or we're never going to get to anything else. Okay, it's kind of small. One of my favorite things in here so far is that I've noticed all these cars have a little HW decal. I love the idea that Harold Warp put a sticker on every single one of his cars just in case there was any confusion about whose they were. Gosh, some of these got really big and heavy. Okay, classic automobiles are interesting, but I hear there's even more of them in other buildings here. They've got some other really fascinating stuff in here. Everything from old bread and butter wagons to grocery delivery wagons to old school early flying machines. Look at some of these. Very fitting for a guy who made his money partially through the magic of aviation. I think it would take you all day, literally, just to look at everything in this one part of this one building, because it's much more than just the big stuff. There are also case after case of artifacts in here. Everything from digital watches to bicycle lamps and old telephones. Look at this old 1950s telephone booth. Ooh, let's cram ourselves inside. That was a popular fad back in the day. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad there's nobody else in here. One is enough. Whew. Anyway, besides just the artifacts themselves, there are hundreds of little signs in here giving you all kinds of historical information, many of which were apparently written by Harold Warp himself. Dude, he sounds like my kind of guy. Okay, now obviously this place isn't called Harold Warp's Pioneer Museum. It's called Harold Warp's Pioneer Village. And that's for very, very good reason. Because as fascinating as all the exhibits are inside of this main building, and there is some seriously fascinating stuff in here, the true spirit of the Pioneer Village is located outside of the back of the main building, where Harold Warp really did create his own pioneer village made up of at least 17 or 18 historic structures mostly purchased and moved here for a total of 28 buildings in all housing altogether more than 50,000 old school old timey artifacts and dude this is flipping amazing when you walk out of that main building you really do feel like you stepped into some kind of little village or town. Maybe smaller and very different than Henry Ford's Greenfield Village, which we just visited a little while ago. But it is all the more epic, considering that this was one man's wacky idea. And for 70 years, generations of people have been visiting this place. And having their minds blown. Now, I believe the first building Harold Warp purchased for his Pioneer Village was this one. His actual childhood schoolhouse. Look at this. It was called the Grom School. And it's here to give us a sense of what it was like to be educated in a rural schoolhouse. All right, you come in here, you hang up your coat and galoshes, and then come on inside. I was just thinking about that feeling when you first start school again, you're all nervous, especially a new school, and you're like, have things changed over the summer, you know? Are people gonna like me? Is the teacher gonna be mean this year? I was just realizing that all the kids that went to this school probably felt that same feeling. Although, I guess, in a very small town, you probably know most of the kids you were going to school with. Still, I know I have trouble fitting in. Oh. Now this one is awesome. I've seen a lot of little replica schoolhouses or old preserved schoolhouses, but never with the old water pail in it or pictures of presidents or all the books here in the bookshelf. Oh, they even have the little roll up maps over the blackboard. This is easily the most complete looking, realistic looking schoolhouse I've ever been in. And I guess that's the benefit of Harold Warp going to school here. He knew what was in here, including some playground equipment. Look at that. There's the school bell. 
Look at these old school baseball bats. <gasps> wow, and masks and baseball mitts. Dude, there's even some ice skates in there. Got your early first aid kit. Oh, and look at that right there. That is Harold Warp's diploma. For regular attendance. And there's a picture of him right here while he was attending this school. Dude, that is wild. Here's a photo of this school taken in 1890. That is so cool. He really did preserve it just the way it was. Excuse me, teacher? What is it, Justin? Can I go to the restroom? No, please? you can't go to the restroom again. You're going to sit in the corner, you dunce. I don't like school. I'm getting out of here. Harold Wharf wasn't just nostalgic for his school. Because right next door to it is something equally incredible. The authentic sod house. And yes, that sod as in dirt. Lumber was scarce on the Great Plains and on the prairies of Nebraska. And so early pioneers had to use whatever wood they could find and combine it with these mud bricks. This was a very common style of architecture for early Nebraska. And the crazy part is, this is a replica of the home Harold Warp was born in. Yeah, the dude went from a sod house, a house made of dirt with an old rifle up there on the beam, to inventing and manufacturing plexiglass, which they actually called flexoglass. And this is literally some of the Warp Brothers flexoglaze right here. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that to be absolutely astounding. This guy was born into a dirt house without any indoor plumbing or anything like that. Sharing a tiny space like this with his parents and siblings. And then going from the farm like this to manufacturing futuristic plastic glass and then making them for all those World War II bombers, getting rich and building Nebraska's most popular tourist attraction with 50,000 items in it. Man, the dude was the definition of success. Look at this over here. Here's a chest of drawers, a scatole or whatever they're called, built by his father, John Warp, while they were homesteading out there. That's so crazy. Anyway, you can see Harold Warp wasn't just a fan of the old pioneer days. He lived the old pioneer homesteading days. And he was genuinely enthusiastic about how much amazing progress he'd seen in his own life. And created this place to immortalize, to share that progress with thousands and thousands of visitors. Look at this. They have the old actual Warp family horse barn. And I didn't even notice the playground behind the school. Look at that whirly doodle over there. Or how about the old swing set? I tried to go down the slide, but unfortunately my rump was too wide. Oh man, no more fun full for me. We'll just have to find our fun elsewhere. Now each one of the buildings at Pioneer Village has got historical importance or important historical artifacts inside. Like look at the old firehouse here. You have everything from the old fire sirens and fire engines to even older equipment like this pump. Or how about this ladder wagon right here, which has the equipment for a bucket brigade. That's old school. Oh, no, wait a minute. That's old school. This is just old. I guess it's a police and fire museum, kind of, because look at this old jail. This one's supposedly from 1850. It was very common to purchase an old iron jail like this and set it up in town. And the worst part was it didn't necessarily have to be inside another building. They could lock you up in a metal jail like this, in a metal cage, and stick you outside in the sun if they wanted. Now quickly, since we started in the middle, I kind of want to jump back to the beginning and show you the Elm Creek Fort, one of the first buildings in Webster County, Nebraska, built as a dwelling and community fort against Native American attacks. And it's a very rare piece of Nebraska history in that it is an old log building and it's survived all this time. And I gotta say, for as rough as it looks on the outside, it's kitted out pretty nicely on the inside. Wow. Oh, check this out. We can actually go upstairs. I don't normally think of log buildings being two stories. That's crazy. Woohoo. Very cramped living conditions up here. But look at that. Look how nice that looks. Not bad if you were surrounded by nothing but open prairie and grassland and it was as hot as it is out there today, you'd be grateful for any shade. I love that nothing in these buildings is actually glass. It's all Harold Warp's old flexo glass or flexo glaze. And look at this. Here it is flexing right there. I think it'd be really interesting to spend a week somewhere or even just a couple of days, maybe an overnight or two in an old pioneer style cabin, whether on the plains or in the mountains, you know, wearing what they wore, doing what they did, 
you know, probably eating what they eat, except for the fact that I don't know how to make food myself and would probably starve immediately. Okay, I take it back. I'd like to do it just with a microwave and a fridge, you know. Look at this, imagination plus incentive creates ambition. Ambition plus action creates courage and strength. Harold Ward. I'm gonna tell you right now, if buying old school buildings like this and collecting all this amazing stuff makes you warped, then I wanna be warped and twisted. Well, maybe not twisted. Oh, this is exciting. Look at this next door. The People's Store. Anyone up for a game of checkers? Holy cow. Again, I see a lot of replica general stores, but never one this full. They have everything from the old cigar store wooden Indians to the postcard racks, which are full. Saws and hammers and hooks and needles, threads, grommets, buttons, pots and pans. Look at the display of old shoes, full of the actual items. This is incredible, dude. Get yourself a new hat today, sir? Perhaps a shirt? No, no, I'm, I'm just browsing. Well, I hope you're planning on spending some money today, my good sir. We don't like looky-loos. How can I help being a looky-loo in here? I don't even know what some of this stuff is, but I like to learn. Look at that, look at the old jars of seeds, and here's some old P.O. boxes from old Fort Kearney but many general stores would have a little place for you to collect your mail. This is interesting down here, these big porcelain jugs. Does anyone know what those are for? Are they for dairy? What are they? Look at that, the old weights, the old catalogs and scissors and needles and combs and brushes and mirrors. I'd love to play it cool and tell you I know what all this stuff is, but I really don't. There's a lot of stuff in here that I'm like, what's that for? Uh, this is so awesome. It must've been really exciting to come in here from your sod house and your farm, you know. And then see what back then were very brightly colored packaging, you know. See the latest tools and pieces of machinery, things that you're like, oh, you can buy that now? You don't have to make it? I mean, do you remember that feeling when you're a kid of going to Toys R Us, you know, and you have some money or picture your favorite place to go shopping now and you can't wait to see like what kind of new stuff they have? That was like this back in the day. Hmm, reaching across fence will trigger security alarm. I don't believe you. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> I know we make plenty of old school stuff for reenactors and stuff today, but I don't think we make this much. It would be cool for someone to have a store like this. I imagine it must have been awesome being the proprietor back in the day because everybody had to come to you. You could learn all the news, all the gossip. You knew who owned what if you wanted to borrow something or even more importantly, because of the old credit system, you know, Probably most of the people in the nearby area would end up owing you money at one point or another, which means you could get all the favors you wanted. Anyway, what have we here next door? Ah, this is the old actual land office where the pioneering homesteaders came to file their paperwork, get themselves a little piece of land, which they then had to build a dwelling on and had to work, you know, and settle on what back then was a very barren windswept, uncertain land, you know. They were brave, the pioneers, they were brave. Let's get out of here though, because this is a government office. And let's face it, nobody likes the government. Whoa, dude, this is awesome. We skipped right by this earlier. Would you look at the size of that old school locomotive? That is awesome. I'd love to drive a huge steam locomotive like this. But if in that one's a mat big for your taste, there's a little one right next to it. Huh? look how tiny it is. It's like an alley size version. It reminds me of Casey Jr. Check it out on the inside. That's the Johnson bar over there. That's a thing I know the name of. Look at this even better. Here's the thing I don't know the name of, but I've seen in one billion cartoons. I'm not gonna lie to you. I would really like to push this lever down, but I'm afraid it would actually move. And I don't wanna be scolded. If there's one thing I hate, it's being scolded. This is so cool. You can climb aboard all this stuff and you'll know when it's allowed because they'll have a little hand here that says, okay. That's when you know you're allowed to touch whatever you want. There's the Johnson bar again in the old throttle. This is where the engineer sat. And then on the other side, I believe this is a seat for the fireman so you could keep the boiler going. Looks like there's a lot of parts missing from this locomotive. Check this out. There's the tender right there where you would have kept all the coal. That is wild. So there was a dude standing up here shoveling coal into this huge boiler in the heat, standing over this metal plate, this gap between the two cars that does move. If you'd like an idea, like to get a sense of what that would have been like, check out the video I made where I drove one of the steam engines at Knott's Berry Farm in California. Oh man, there's nothing like a good caboose. And some of those old school train men 
must have felt the same way. Can you imagine the dances they did in here? train men. Wow, I didn't even notice this, but if you pull yourself out of the caboose, there's an old historic train depot back here, the Lowell Depot. And once again, this is something you see all over the place. There are tons of converted old train depots. They convert them into visitor centers or public restrooms. Every once in a while you get one turned into a museum. But very rarely do they all still have their lights and stoves, the old original waiting benches, ticket counters. Wow, look at all the old railroad lanterns. There's the desk over there, conductor's hat. Don't forget the railroad office was a very important place because it was usually also the telegraph office. Boy, it's a really dark room in here. Probably doesn't look as dark to you right now, but it's pitch black. If somebody jumps out at me right now, I will pee. Let that be a warning to all of you. Now I'm sure you've noticed that not everything here in the Pioneer Village is in perfect repair. That's because sadly, not only did Harold Warp, the head of the operation, pass away in 1994. But the town that the Pioneer Village is located in, Minden, Nebraska, is located along US Highway 6, which used to be the main route through the area if you were crossing from east to west. But sadly, it was bypassed by the modern Interstate 80 15 minutes north of here. And without being right off the highway anymore, the amount of visitors to the Pioneer Village instantly dropped to some pretty low numbers. And the museum, which I believe Harold Warp gave to the town or created a trust for all the way back in 1983, so he knew that one day it would have to pass on so it could stay open to the public, began to slowly, slowly, just kind of corrode away out here. There wasn't much maintenance, very low budgets because very low visitor attendance. Piece after piece of working machinery on display went silent. And even the old formerly working 1879 carousel, or merry-go-round actually, went out of operation. Look at that. That is so sad looking. And a few years ago, you would have just been looking at that feeling sad without any hope. But thankfully, the townspeople of Minden realized if they didn't save this place, it was gonna collapse into the dirt. And they sort of formed a little citizens council, a little board to oversee this. They've done fundraising and they've organized volunteer groups from around the country to come out here. That's why some of the paint is more fresh now. The sign out front has been restored. Hopefully, through their efforts, which are still ongoing and they're still looking for donations and help if you can manage to make your way out here. This amazing roadside attraction and piece of history will be preserved for future generations. Ooh, look at that old stagecoach treasure box. A little sneaky hidden one. This is from the Black Hills. That's crazy. This would have had dead wood gold in it. This is a real actual Pony Express saddle. You could reach out and touch it. I won't, but you could. You could still see the rider's rump crease all over this thing. That would have been one heck of a job. Just getting on a horse and riding as fast as you can over all the nothing. You deliver very thin, very lightweight, very expensive messages. Most of the Pony Express riders were just riding from station to station, so you'd be riding across the plains, the prairie, unprotected, friendless, speed, your only defense. Horse and rider exhausted, dripping with sweat till they got to the next station where they would hop out get a rest, get back on a horse, and go back the other way. I suppose there are plenty of people who like riding horses fast that would have loved to have had that job, and they were very well respected in their own time, of course. The citizens and the people getting the mail from the Pony Express really loved them, but that job had, had to get tedious. Just imagine the saddle sores. When you eventually visited town to go to the blacksmith, you would have been pretty sore. I was thinking about getting myself a metal chair, but now I've changed my mind, at least until I switch jobs. Would you look at the size of those bellows in here? Boy, there's a lot of stuff in the old smithy. I would like to learn to shape metal one day. I've done a little bit of welding in my time, but really not much with metal. Not a big fan of sparks and hot things and fire. And again, I never thought I'd be wood carving and now I'm making tiki's and all kinds of stuff, so you never know. Maybe one day I will be a smithy. Okay, tucked away behind some of these pioneer village buildings. There are other more industrial looking buildings with even more artifacts aplenty inside. You got tractors and 
farm equipment going all the way back to sheep herders wagons and authentic cowboy chuck wagons. That's a real chuck wagon right there. That is pretty cool. And then you get into some of the early mechanized farm equipment, starting with giant steam engines to run some of your gear, and then some of these self-driving steam engines or early, early tractors. Tractor history goes all the way back to the 1880s and I think even the 1870s, perhaps earlier. I'm not completely well-versed in tractor history. I've never owned one. <laughs> I've only ridden a tractor or two occasionally. Look at the roof on this guy. Amazing. I'm sure these would have been familiar sights to my late great-grandfather, Lorne. He had a dairy farm in Ontario, Canada, just outside of Brantford. And even in his 90s, he'd tell me all about the farm across the road that he used to own and his old tractors. Man, once you use a tractor, apparently, you get quite attached. Dude, there are so many buildings here. Look, there at is no way we are going to see them all. And if I'm even going to keep on trying, I've got to take a little break. Sadly, the snack bar, which is an old authentic Valentine diner, the aristocrat sandwich shop model, is closed for the season. And I think has been closed for several seasons. Ah, so I think I'm gonna have to head back to the van and rehydrate. Ah, there's just a different kind of heat in the West. It's not worse or better than the heat on the East Coast. Just different. The sun just goes right into your cranium, you know. Oh. I just want to point out how incredibly modern and awesome the architecture of this building would have been back in 1953. Those curved sort of streamlined ends are particularly impressive. I mean, I would have pulled over to take a picture of this building, even if it didn't have an epic tourist attraction inside. And I don't want to point out the negatives, but you can see even in the parking lot, the grass growing up through the cracks and stuff like that. It's obvious that the Pioneer Village is no longer in its glory days of US 6 travel over here. And nowhere is that more obvious than when you look next door and realize that the Herald War Pioneer Village had its own motel and campground. Hey, that was my first car. A green Ford Aerostar. Pioneer Village had an Aerostar. Awesome. Anyway, it isn't the most likely place to stay, but clearly it used to be a very popular place to stay because not only is there this little tiny strip that we've looked at so far, but the motel was at one time so successful that they managed to build that extension wing back behind you and this two-story, even bigger, motel complex with a little convention center on it. Now, the office sign was on in the motel. I don't know if you can still stay in any of the motel buildings. I see lights on in them. Judging from the hole in the roof over there, I don't think the event center is operational anymore. And other than that old Ford, there are no cars in the parking lot. Oh my gosh, you can see just how many buildings back there we haven't been in. All right, all right, let's get back in there. Now, I've done the math and 150,000 visitors a year it means that at one point, an average of over 400 people per day were visiting this place. And even with every single one of them here at the same time, all four or 500 of them, it would never feel packed. It's an absolutely enormous place and worth every penny to visit because don't forget, like I said, there's 50,000 items here and it would be a great place to stop, even with kids, if they're old enough to wander around on their own. There is so much here that they could discover, you know, to get the imagination going. Which of course is and always was the point. Dude, look at the size of this place. Everything from early televisions and old motion picture machines, to player pianos and calliopes. Look at that Philco predicted television there. There's VCRs, which must have seemed very high tech when they were first put in here. And now they're a relic just like the rest of these antiques. Oh yeah, I'm never gonna be able to show you all of this because there is little diorama after diorama, display after display. These are just kitchens moving up through the years like the Carousel of Progress. Each one is interesting, each one. It's full of artifacts and little details letting you know exactly what it would have been like to live back at that time. Look at the 1940s and 50s. And then I remember this one well, the 1980 kitchen. Our kitchen didn't look like this. We lived in an apartment, but I had a lot of friends with kitchens almost identical to this. Oh my gosh, that was just one row of this one building. Look at all of those kitchens. And now, around the corner, we get all the bedrooms and living rooms. Now I ask you, I remember this one very fondly, the 1980 living room. What looks better, that or the 1950 living room? Because I've been thinking about this a lot lately. We have way too much industrial minimalism. Things that look basic and simple just because they're easier to manufacture that way. Oh gosh, I think my grandma had that exact lamp. Anyway, what I mean is that the farther back you go, 
the more detail and craftsmanship there are in things. I mean, look at this bed from 1890. Amazing. But I don't even just mean like fancy carved furniture. Some of that can be a taste thing, right? Minimalism can be sort of an art form. I mean, oh my gosh, I thought I just saw a ghost through that window. It's just a mannequin. <laughs> I mean, even consider things like traffic lights. If you see an old street lamp from the 1800s, it's got some design, some style to it. Nowadays, you might just have a pole with a light bulb on it, you know what I mean? I often wonder what that says about us, you know, in our, in our modern time. Because the more mass produced everything is, the more the same everywhere becomes. What does that do to us? We're losing a lot of culture, you know? Then again, at the same time and in the same breath, I wouldn't want to go back to this time period where people had to be put into iron lungs because we didn't have things like vaccines and antibiotics. Or the old timey dentist equipment. No thanks. Dude, it was hard graft back in the day. Look at these common items for children or whatever. Look at that rug beater. Have you ever had to beat a rug with a rug beater? I have. It was horrible. Look at this beauty shop. Look at that lady back there. In 1941, the cold wave permanent, the basis of today's perms, was developed. That is scary looking. Ah, here we have somewhere to get a shave and a haircut. Just two bits. Wait a minute. Inflation. That'll be $25. Boy, oh boy, we've got the jewelry shop, the carpenter shop. What is this? Uh, the tin shop. Okay. There's the cooperage shop for making barrels. They've got a law office in here. A whole display of old-timey Aladdin lamps. Spinning wheels. They sure have shown a lot of technological progress in here. But of course, none so dear to Harold Warp. That's Flexo glass. Look at that. There's some of his early plastic material for building the greenhouses. There's some Flexo glaze down there, which is the plexiglass we've been seeing all over the shop. Look at all of this. Look at the advertising. That's beautiful. Dang, look how many different products they made. They made Trash can liners and warps, ground cloth, little plastic camping tarps. They made toys and storm window kits. Pretty darn awesome. Oh my gosh, I only took so much time down there because I didn't know there was an upstairs. Holy flexo glass. Would you look at the size of this? This place shows the evolution of furniture in a very big way. Look at all this. This looks like a furniture store, like a big modern corporate furniture store full of every kind of furniture imaginable and a lot of it still has the prices that you would have paid for it at the time on it look at that 1940s and 50s there's some stuff from the 1920s honestly it doesn't even really look that old this is all very interesting if you really stop to think about it but boy when it's all assembled like this it is it's hard to wrap your brain around i'd love to visit this place with older people like my grandparents if they were still alive just to hear you know what sort of stuff in here would bring back memories for them like which of these items they owned oh my gosh look up here that is terrifying. A lot of stuff in here. Probably a lot of ghosts though. Mm, scary. Oh my gosh, there are five more huge buildings in the back. I'm running out of time. Normally I'd think that's okay. It gives me an excuse to come back, but I have no idea when I'm gonna be back through this part of Nebraska. Certainly though, it's going to be fun when I do come back. Cause each of these buildings appears to be two stories with so much stuff stuffed inside. And as a lover of history, there really isn't much I don't like learning about. So this place gives me an excuse to see all kinds of things I would have never, ever thought about learning about before. And I can totally see why it used to draw hundreds of thousands of visitors out here. Because whether you're interested in bicycles and motorbikes or vintage automobiles, signs, advertising, products, historical buildings, this place is incredible. Right, Homer? Yep, incredible. You'll try thinking it's incredible after working in here for 70 years, though, I'll tell you that. I tell you what, if you only have an hour or two to stop by and see this place, it is totally worth it. I mean, just for the cars alone, it's one of the best car museums I've ever seen. They've got all the Buicks and Chevys and Fords in chronological order. Here's a bunch of Cadillacs. But you could genuinely spend an entire day, maybe two days in this place, and the village could use your help. Because it is a battle against time and nature to save some of these historic buildings. And absolutely worth your time and the admission fee to save Nebraska's former top tourist attraction. And I have to be honest with you, one of the most creative, innovative, interesting, and educational roadside attractions I have ever seen in my life. I mean, seriously, it's amazing here. And as an added bonus, if ghosts are real, this place is definitely haunted. It is so creepy. <laughs> Maybe even a little 
too amazing. I'm having a hard time showing you just how huge and enormous each one of these buildings is. And they're packed with so many rare and precious artifacts. I'm literally tempted to stay here another day just to try to see all of them. But I'm gonna tell you right now, I've been over quite a bit of this country, and there's nothing else quite like Harold Warp's Pioneer Village anywhere. We're seriously pressed for time now, but it's never a bad idea to go to church. Particularly Harold Warp's old 1800s church. What is it about being in an old church by yourself, particularly if there are any statues inside? That is so creepy. This reminds me of uh, Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow a little bit for some reason. Beautiful pressed tin Walls, though, look at that pattern. Oh, I love these last two buildings. Hobbies that kept man busy and household appliances lessened women's work. I guess that's very true. I guess it is certainly a fact that all these modern household appliances that we take for granted made life, particularly for women in the past, much, much easier and freed up a lot more of their time, which of course led to much less division of labor, you know? Because even the dumbest man I know can use a microwave. But I gotta be honest with you, I don't normally sit there and think about how household appliances led to more time and equality. Oh my gosh, this is so scary. I can't find the light switch, and it feels like there are the ghosts of a thousand moms in this place. I'm out. Imagine seeing a ghost pop up in one of these old tiny bathtubs. It would be terrifying and hilarious, but also terrifying. Get out of the way, washing machine! I want to see the hobbies that kept the men busy! Wait a minute, how come the men were busy with hobbies and the women were busy with work? Hmm, that doesn't seem fair to me. Whoa! Look at that button collection. There are so many things with buttons all over them! Or how about this? Look at the size of the salt and pepper shaker collection. I'm starting to wonder what the men were doing around here. There are dozens of cases of pens and old pencils. No joke. Millions of glass and knick-knack shoes. Teacups and little creamy, porty things. So, so, so many ashtrays and fans. Little glass and porcelain horses and dogs. This all looks like the kind of stuff my Nana would collect. Look at this, there's even a whole bunch of historical figurines in here. Hey, there's Mark Twain. Ah, my Aunt Ruth Ann used to have a bunch of these, but the Avon ones, you know, like the First Lady collection and stuff. Look at the size of that pen collection. Does Avon still exist? Does anyone know? All right, friends, there's so many weird and wonderful things in here, but I have to leave now. The Pioneer Village is a place I hope to visit again, particularly because no matter how many videos I film in here, there is no way I could spoil it all for you. If you've been looking for an excuse for a road trip, it turns out that Nebraska is not a bad option. So come on down here to the Pioneer Village because they have so, so, so much stuff to show you. Things, I guarantee, some of which you have never seen before. Plus the gift shop has some very old school gifts. Get here before they run out. Well, that was a day very well spent, my friends. And I just found out after purchasing some epic stuff from the gift shop, some of which I'll bring down to the booth, by the way, at home, that the motel is indeed closed, but they are hoping to restore it in the future. So come on down here, like I said, to the Pioneer Village, pay the entry fee, see the amazing exhibits, and do your part to keep a little piece of American roadside history alive. But for now, for watching this video, you've done your duty. And we can all Go home and sleep well. I was about to choke on my own words. Building Nevada's most popular, ne I keep saying Nevada, it's Nebraska, geez. And I didn't notice the playground behind the cool <laughs> to be inside another building. They could lock you, Ugh. And I didn't even notice the old school playground behind the school. Old school playground behind the school, is that redundant? This is the old actual, Ugh. 
But this is a thing that the first bit. Okay, start from the beginning. 